Okay, in the last lecture, we left off talking about a variety of geometric predicates, and we're going to continue along on this theme today. So to begin with, I'm going to talk about the locally preferred directions, the Wannay test. This is another predicate, and it's used, its application is in the use of computing preferred directions, the Wannay triangulations. So in this case, what we have is we have some edge in the triangulation, and we want to check to see whether it satisfies what's called a locally preferred directions, the Wannay condition. And this condition, if it's satisfied by, by all flippable edges in the triangulation, then the triangulation is a preferred direction to one a triangulation, which is always uniquely determined. So what we do is we take the edge that we want to test to see whether it satisfies this, this uh, locally preferred direction to one a condition. And it, this edge will have two incident faces because the edge is flippable, otherwise we wouldn't be testing it. So by definition, it has two incident faces, which are the two faces that are shown here. And then arbitrarily, we pick one of the faces and we label the vertices of this triangle ABC. And then the remaining face, we label the remaining point as D. And what we do in this particular test is we form the circumcircle through ABC. And then what we want to do is we want to check whether D lies outside, inside, or on the circle. Um, in, and this is effectively what we were doing in the locally Delaunay test that we talked about in the last lecture. If I flip back to the previous slide, this is what we talked about last lecture. Um, in addition to this, though, the problem with this particular uh, predicate is if we use this to generate a triangulation, the Delaunay triangulation that results is not necessarily uniquely determined. So what we want to do is we want to get rid of this non-uniqueness and ensure that the result is unique. And the way that we do this in the locally preferred directions Delaunay test, in other words, for preferred directions Delaunay triangulations, is we introduce two directions, which are denoted by these vectors u and v. And if I go back to the earlier slide where we looked at one of the reasons why you can have non-uniqueness in the Delaunay triangulation, so if we go back to this earlier slide here, um, this is an example of two triangulations of the same point set. We have basically nine points that are arranged on a grid, like these three points here, these three points along here, and then these three points along the bottom. Uh, if you compare the triangulations in the left figure and the right figure, you can see that they're different because some of the edges are not the same. So for example, we have this edge here where this edge has been replaced over here by the opposite diagonal of the square that that edge appears in. Um, so effectively what the, the, the uh, preferred direction Delaunay triangulation does is it says that in cases where edges can be flipped one of two ways, in other words, this edge here could be left as it is, or we could also obtain a Delaunay triangulation by replacing this edge by performing an edge flip. If we flip this edge, then we, this edge will be transformed into this edge here. And both of these are, are legal Delaunay triangulations. But the thing that leads to the multiple choices, the multiple possible correct answers, is effectively this situation where where the uh, edge can, an edge can be flipped one of two ways, and both of them lead to a valid triangulation, a valid Delaunay triangulation. So with the preferred direction approach, what we do is we prefer that the, uh, of these two choices we can make for the original edge and its flipped version, we say that we want to choose the one that has a preferred direction. In other words, the slope of the line segment has some is closer to some preferred slope uh, than the other choice that we have to make. So if we go back to the... Uh, predicate that we want to talk about here. This is the role that's played by these vectors u and v. These are the directions that we're going to use in order to define a preferred orientation for the edge that we choose in the case that we have the freedom to choose between its edge and its flip version. So in this particular case, the flip version of e would correspond to the edge from a to d. Uh, because essentially what we have here, there's two incident faces on e which form this larger uh, quadrilateral if we take the union of these two faces. And what we're interested in is if we can replace this edge here by its diagonal, other diagonal, which would be between A and D. So if we look at what's actually done in the case of this particular predicate for locally preferred directions Delaunay test, the more interesting thing is to look at the next slide here. Effectively, what we have when we're testing, um, it's very similar to what we had for the local, locally Delaunay test. Um, basically, this, these first two cases are identical. We do a, a, we do an oriented circle test, and we check to see if the point point D is outside the circle. Then we say that the triangulation is Delaunay, which is basically the first case here. If it's inside the circle, then we say it's not Delaunay because this would violate the Delaunay condition. But unlike the case of the locally Delaunay test, which we talked about previously, 
In the case that the point falls exactly on the circle, which would correspond to this in circle ABCD being equal to zero, which is essentially this otherwise case here. In this case, rather than just saying, oh, it's okay, it's Delaunay, which would be the case, it's true. Instead, we say we only accept it as being a valid uh, Delaunay triangulation if another condition is met, which is that um, this magical alpha function is equal to one. So if we back up to the previous slide where alpha is defined, what you can see it's doing here is it's just doing a test for preferred directions. So it's testing the, uh, the line segment BC and the line segment AD to see which one of them has a, is, is preferred. And we're doing the comparison with respect to the direction, U, direction vector U. So if we go to the diagram here, we have the edge BC, which is this edge here. The other edge, which is AD, which is from the other diagonal of the quadrilateral associated with ABCD which would be from A to D here. And we're trying to ask the question, because in the case where um, the in-circle result is equal to zero, what this is saying is we can flip the edge either way and both of them will lead to a valid Delaunay triangulation. So what we do is we say, we're gonna pick of these two, we're gonna pick the one that is more preferred in terms of its orientation. So for example, we'd, between the line segment AD and the line segment CB, we would choose the one whose slope is closer to you. And if, if, if uh, BC is, is preferred over AD, then, or sorry, if CB is preferred over, yeah, it, sorry, if CB is preferred over AD, which is basically what we have here already, we haven't, you know, CB is already in the triangulation, the edge between CB, then the triangle, we actually have a, something that looks like a valid uh, locally preferred direction, the Lonnie triangulation. Um, if on the other hand, when we compare the, uh, the uh, slope of U to the slope of AD and CB. If the conclusion we come to is they're both equally good, in other words, CB and AD both have, have the same difference in, in slope or angle compared to U, in other words, we have a tie, then what we do is we, so in this case, the preferred direction is equal to zero. In this case, what we do is we break the tie by instead of using the direction vector U, we use the direction vector V. So we repeat exactly the same test but instead of asking the question whether CB is closer in slope to, to uh, our direction vector U than AD, we instead compare it to the direction vector V. So we're using this other vector. And because V and U are not allowed to be parallel to one another, and they're also not allowed to be orthogonal to one another, it turns out that we can never have to break a tie in the second case. In other words, when we're testing this condition here, this condition can never be equal to zero. In other words, we can't have a tie when we're doing this preferred direction test. And then, it, it, so if, if this is the case, then we say that the, the triangulation or this particular edge is optimal or, or locally preferred direction Delaunay, according to this test. Otherwise, we say it's not. And again, because of this extra case that we've added, if we go back to the next slide here, because of this extra case that we've added for handling the in-circle ABCD equal to zero case, which is what this otherwise corresponds to, this eliminates the possibility for multiple answers for the Delaunay triangulation. So this always leads to a unique triangulation. Uh, the next thing I need to talk about is the actual algorithm that we use for computing triangulations. Uh, which is called the Lawson Local Optimization Procedure. It's a little bit more general than just something used for computing Delaunay triangulations. It can be used for other purposes, but the purposes for which we're, it's being presented here is for the purposes of computing a Delaunay triangulation. And the algorithm actually is relatively uh, simple in terms of what it does. Uh, first, I need to introduce a little bit of terminology. So in the triangulation, we talked about flippable edges before. So a flippable edge is said to be optimal with respect to this optimization procedure that we're introducing here. Uh, if the edge is not flippable, or it is flippable and it satisfies some optimality criteria, where the optimality, optimality criteria is either the locally Delaunay test that we talked about earlier in the last lecture, or the preferred directions locally Delaunay test that we just finished talking about a moment ago. And, and essentially what we want to do with this algorithm, or maybe I should introduce another term first though, uh, in the case of an edge, if we don't know whether it's optimal with respect to the particular optimality criterion we're using, as a matter of terminology, we say the edge is suspect. So suspect just means that it's op the ed optimality of the edge is uncertain. So we need to test it and check to see whether it's optimal before we can make any conclusion. And with that said, the algorithm itself, what it does, it conceptually at least, is very simple. Uh, what we do is we start out essentially with a list of all the suspect edges, all the edges that we're not sure if they're optimal or not. In other words, we're, if we're computing a Delaunay triangulation, just a plain vanilla Delaunay triangulation, all the edges that we're not sure if they're locally Delaunay. 
that we need to test. Or in the case of a preferred direction, uh, locally Delaunay or preferred direction Delaunay triangulation, we would be using the preferred direction locally Delaunay condition. So you have this list of suspect edges, the edges that we're not sure if they're optimal. And then what we're going to do is we're going to loop, and this corresponds to this bullet here. We're just going to loop, and then each time through the loop, what we'll do is we'll remove one element from our list of suspect edges, and we'll do the following. Uh, we'll check to see whether the edge is optimal using our optimality criteria. Again, if we're doing a Delaunay triangulation, it would be the locally Delaunay test. If it's a preferred direction type triangulation, we use the preferred directions locally Delaunay test. And if it's optimal, then we're good. We don't need to do anything. Um, but if the edge isn't optimal, then what we need to do is perform an edge flip. So we flip the edge. And when we do this, as a result of flipping the edge, it's quite likely that some of the other edges that we already might have checked and that we know were op optimal previously, they might not be optimal anymore because we've just changed part of the triangulation. So this can affect the optimality of some of the edges. And I'll get to this in a moment in particular on the next slide, which edges are actually affected, which ones we need to uh, reconsider. Um, but the edges that we need to reconsider after we perform an edge flip, we then need to add them to our suspect list. And we just basically keep looping each time through the loop. We remove an element from our list of suspect edges. We check to see if it's optimal. If it is optimal, we're good. We don't need to do anything. If it isn't optimal, then what we do is we flip the edge. Then any new edges, that any new suspect edges that result from that get added to our list of suspect edges if they're not already on the list. And we keep looping until the suspect edge list is empty. And once it's empty, this means all the edges are known to be optimal. So at least conceptually, the algorithm is, is relatively simple. So how do we use this algorithm in order to find Delaunay triangulations? Well, I kind of, I, I guess I kind of covered this to a large extent before. Essentially, what we're going to do is we're either going to use for our optimality criteria, the locally Delaunay or preferred direction locally Delaunay condition, the, the test that we were talking about before. And really what this slide is about is in the case that we perform an edge flip. So suppose that we're looking at some portion of the triangulation and we're focusing on this particular edge here. And suppose that we've applied the optimality criterion test. So we've either done a locally Delaunay test or a preferred directions locally Delaunay test. And the conclusion, suppose that we come to the conclusion that based on this test, we've come to the conclusion that the edge is not optimal. In other words, we need to perform an edge flip. So what that means is we take this edge here and we're going to delete it and replace it by the other diagonal of the enclosing quadrilateral. So this uh, quadrilateral here, which corresponds to the two incident faces on, on E, we're going to uh, delete E, this edge E, and replace it by the opposite diagonal, which would be from this vertex here to this vertex here. In other words, we replace it by this new edge E prime. And the subtlety here is when we do this, though, the fact that we've changed part of the triangulation could cause some edges that previously when we tested them were optimal, but now they might not be optimal anymore. In other words, they become suspect due to the fact we've done this edge flip. And it turns out the particular pattern of edges that we need to recheck, the ones that may previously have been optimal but no longer are due to the fact that we flipped this edge E to this new edge E prime, are the edges that correspond to the ones that are shown as thick lines here. In particular, they're the edges that correspond to the edges that are incident on, on, or that basically form the border of the quadrilateral associated with this edge E. Again, remember, um, E, the edge E has two incident faces, this left triangle face here and this right triangle face here. Together, they form a quadrilateral if you take their union. And essentially, it's the edges of this quadrilateral which are shown here as thick lines. These are the edges that we would have to retest. So this is the basic idea of how the whole method works. Um, so this kind of brings us to the end of the interval arithmetic and sort of applications. But I want to make one additional comment which is with respect to data structures that are used for representing more generally polygon meshes. So like if you're into like three-dimensional kind of geometry, like games, for example, um, then you're probably going to deal with data structures for representing things like what I'm talking about here, like poly polyhedral meshes and so on, because this is most commonly the way that you're, you represent models inside the computer. Um, in this case, we're just going to be talking about triangulation, so it's basically a polygon mesh that's flat, because the triangulation just sits in the plane. It's not like a 3D, like a truly 3D thing. Uh, but the data structures we're going to talk about can be applied more generally to like three-dimensional objects as well. Anyway, the first thing I want to talk about is sort of the most straightforward way that you might use to, to uh, represent a, a polygon mesh, or like a triangle mesh, or more specifically in the case that we're dealing with a triangulation. But a triangulation essentially is just a triangle mesh, or basically a bunch of triangles that are stitched together. Um, so if we wanted to represent them, we could do something like using a, a data structure like what's shown here. 
uh, where each face in the triangulation, so each basically triangle is what I mean by face, um, it has a, uh, three vertices associated with it. So what we have is like an array of, of vertices and the vertices, each, each of these entries has like an X and Y coordinate for the position of the vertex. And then each of these entries in this uh, face array, or in this uh, face array are the, the, uh, the indexes of the three vertices that make up that triangle. So if a triangle had like its vertices were vertex five, vertex six and vertex seven, then this array would store five, six, seven, for example. Um, so this would probably be the most straightforward way. Like if I just asked you and you didn't know anything about data structures that are that are out there that you could choose from, this is kind of the most intuitive sort of approach, right? You basically just build up an array of the vertices and then have an array of the faces, like basically triples of indexes for each of the faces. And you know, it, it, it will work. Um, but the problem with it is for the most types of things that we do in, in geometry processing, this is a really bad way to choose to lay things out in memory because some of the most basic operations that we perform many, many times, because there's some types of things you do more frequently than others. And one of the most basic things that you, you almost always do like very, very frequently in geometry processing algorithms is what we call adjacency queries. What's meant by an adjacency query, maybe this is better explained by the, the next uh, slide here. So basically I have a picture that sort of corresponds to the so-called naive data structure that we're talking about, where this is just a simple uh, triangulation or triangle mesh, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, I guess it's a triangle mesh because there's actually Z coordinates here. The only difference between the picture, like the, the triangulation versus triangle mesh, where you're representing three-dimensional objects with respect to the discussion that I'm going through here, like the discussion is actually a little bit more general than what we need. The only difference is whether these z-coordinates are basically all zero, like the thing sits in the plane and basically you have a triangulation, or if you, you allow the z-coordinates to be kind of anything, and then you can actually have something that takes up a volume and it's sitting like in three-dimensional space. I just mentioned this. Um, because some of you might be not so much interested in triangulations per se, but very interested in games and so on. Like this stuff is very applicable to those sorts of contexts where you're modeling three-dimensional you know, objects in three-dimensional space. Anyway, and this actual example is for three-dimensional kind of shape. This is actually a tetrahedron because we have Z coordinates that have various different values. But you can just imagine they're all zero in the triangulation case. And, and basically the problem is what I mean by adjacency queries is you often have things like questions like the following, where maybe you're looking at a, the algorithm is looking at a particular edge in the triangulation or in the triangle mesh, and then it wants to ask the question, what are the things that are next to this edge? Like, what are the faces that are incident on this edge? So obviously with our eyes, we can look at this and we can say, well, the faces that are incident on this edge here, and there can be at most two of them, and in this case there are two, it's gonna be face number one, F1, and face number zero, F0. But of course, the computer doesn't have eyes. It can't look at this thing and go, oh, it's, it's you know, this, these are the incident faces. What it does is it has to look at the data structure that you're using and navigate it. And the problem is if you want to identify just a simple thing, like trying to identify what are the faces that are incident on this edge, the way that we would have to do this is we'd first of all observe the fact that the endpoints of this edge are V3 and V1. So basically indexes three and one for the vertices. And then what we would have to do is we'd have to scan through the list of faces looking for faces that have both the vertex one and the vertex three in the, for their vertices, right? So this doesn't look so bad here because we have three faces, so there's only three entries in this table we need to look through. Uh, but if you imagine now that this is a practical application, a real world application, sometimes there's build with in some high end applications, meshes that have billions of vertices. So if every time you want to do a simple query like asking what are the faces that are incident on a particular edge? If you had to scan through the list of all the faces, because this is effectively what we're first faced to do, forced to do here, right? We're basically, if we want to find all of the faces that are incident on this edge, we have to go scanning through this array here, looking for entries that have both one and three in them. So for example, face number zero has one and three, and then face number, face number one has both one and three. But it's going to be in general like a linear time algorithm. We have to, in the worst case, scan all the way through the array because the entry that we find could be at the very last slot in the array. And if there's billions of entries, this is going to be very slow. And if this was something we did infrequently, we wouldn't care, right? Because you know, there's no sense trying to optimize something, make it really fast if you do it like you know once every million years. It's not probably going to be a bottleneck in the algorithm. But the thing about uh, adjacency queries, as they're called, like where you're checking what's next to something else, what's adjacent or neighboring on another part of the mesh. This is done maybe the most frequent operation that you do in many geometric algorithms. So you do it millions, billions, trillions of times. So if it's slow, it will kill the algorithm. Uh, so for this reason, this partic particular type of data structure, the one we're talking about on this slide, it's, it's not very practical for almost any kind of processing where we're doing any kind of non-trivial algorithm. 
The only thing it might be good for is if you're just trying to store the triangulation. You're not doing any processing, but you just want to represent it, but not kind of read only. You're not doing anything with it. It might be useful for this purpose because it's, it's fairly compact in terms of the amount of memory it requires. Um, compared to some of the alternatives that we're going to look at. Actually, we're just going to look at one alternative. Uh, so memory, in terms of memory consumption, it's fairly uh, efficient. But in terms of any kind of processing you might want to do with it, it's, use, it's pretty much useless because it's, it's very, very slow for adjacency type queries. So that leads to the question of, well, what, what can we do that, that will work more efficiently, that will allow us to implement many different types of uh, geometric algorithms in a more efficient manner? And in this regard, there's what we call a half-edge data structure. Which, and the reason I need to introduce this is because the particular uh, triangulation class that's provided to you for Part C of the assignment is it, based on half-edge data structure. So if you don't understand what a half-edge data structure is, you'll, of course, have difficulty trying to use that class that's provided to you. So this is the main reason, really, I want to talk about this, is to help with respect to the, the Part C of the current assignment. So um, this is probably best explained in terms of a picture. Uh, which is what's shown here. Again, this, these, these diagrams and, on these slides are a little bit more general than what we need here. But this is handling kind of the case of polygon meshes in 3D, but the basic idea carries over to the special case of the, the polygons are all sitting flat in the plane and they're triangles, they're all triangles, which is what we have in the case of a triangulation. But I wanted to present it in this more general context because it might make it more interesting or relevant to what a lot of your interests are because some of you might be more interested in geometry in 3D compared to just stuff that's flat in the plane, which is just kind of less things that you can do with it. Lots of useful things, but maybe less exciting things. Um, so with the half-edge data structure, it's um, fundamentally based on what are called half-edges, or it's maybe more, more generally, it's an edge-based representation. In other words, what's different between the kind of naive data structure that we looked at here and half-edge-based data structures, this one doesn't even directly represent edges anywhere. There's nowhere in this data structure, maybe back up to the previous slide here with the pseudocode, there's nowhere you can point out in memory that there's an edge. This thing doesn't represent edges at all. It represents faces directly, it represents vertices directly, but it doesn't even have a notion of an edge. So if you start asking questions about edges, you can see, well, maybe it's probably gonna cause some problems. It doesn't even know what an edge is really in a direct sense. Uh, so one thing that's different between this uh, previous data structure and the half-edge data structure is the half-edge data structure is, is an edge-based data structure. There actually is something tangible in memory that you can point at that actually corresponds to an edge. Um, the other thing that's kind of weird here is that it doesn't just kind of stop here with it representing edges. It basically slices and dices things a little bit more finely. It represents each edge as a pair of what are called half-edges. Hence the name half-edges. Each If you take two half-edges together, it makes up one edge. So I guess in that sense, they're half an edge. Um, but what's special about these half edges, so for example, in this diagram here, these, these rectangles that are shaded, this is kind of the legend off to the side here. So the cir open circles are vertices, the filled in circles are faces, and then the rectangles with the pairs of arrows in them are edges. So this is an edge here, and the red edge corresponds to a pair of half edges. And what's special about half edges is they're oriented. They're oriented line segments, so they point in a particular direction. So you represent each edge, and an edge fundamentally is undirected. An edge has no direction. It's just an ordinary line segment. It doesn't point left or right. It just, it just is what it is. Um, but we represent it in, pair, in terms of a pair of directed line segments, essentially, which is what half edges are. And again, or, orientation is nice in a, in a lot of type of geometry processing that we do because it allows us to say in a meaningful way things like, to the left of this thing, or to the right of this thing, or at the end point of this thing, or at the origin, originating point like where this thing starts from or where this thing ends and so on, um, if we're talking about line segments. But we can't do any of these things if we have something that's undirected because there's, you can't attach a meaning of left and right to a line segment. You might say, well, this side is left, this side is right, but then I tell you, close your eyes, I rotate the picture around and ask you to open your eyes and I say, which side's the left? You'll say the opposite thing that you said before. Like there's no way to distinguish. Whereas if there's things are directed, even if I make you close, I say, which side is the left side of this line segment that's directed? Then I ask you to close your eyes, I rotate things around to try to fool you. When you open your eyes again, you'll still give a consistent answer because the arrow tells you which way is the left side. Um, so this orientedness is really a fundamentally important thing and you'll see this in a lot of geometric algorithms just because it makes the code easier to write. It might not be obvious why this is so, but if you actually tried writing code with a data structure that uses like oriented things versus one that doesn't, you'll very quickly come to appreciate the orientedness of things. It, it makes algorithms so much simpler. Anyway, so. This is the basic idea behind this half-edge data structure. So each edge is represented by a pair of half-edges that are basically oriented line segments, oriented in opposite directions. 
And each of these, if we look at the pseudocode down at the bottom here, each half edge has a, has a certain amount of state associated with it. Um, the, the first thing is we have an index saying like, which of the half edges for the edge is this? Because each edge has two half edges, which are indexes zero and index one. So the half edge, sort of for various reasons, it needs to know which half edge of the edge it is. So this index is either zero or one, telling the half edge that if it's zero on the first half edge for this edge, if the index is one, well, not on the second half edge for this edge, just so that it can distinguish which one it is, which turns out to be important to be able to do. Uh, the half edge is a pointer to the next half edge in the counterclockwise direction of, around the face on its left side. So, for example, this half edge here, it ha if the face on its left side, because it's oriented, if you imagine you're standing on that edge facing in the direction that the arrow is pointing, the left side of this half edge E0 is going to be, or the left face of this half edge is going to be this face here. And what we're, what we're trying to specify with next here is if you keep going in the direction that the half edge is pointing around this face, so we're basically kind of doing a, a we're walking around the face in this direction counterclockwise, what's the next half edge that we hit? Well, the next half edge we hit is going to be this half edge here that belongs to this edge. So th th what this pointer here next is pointing to, this pointer is pointing to the next half edge and kind of the loop that goes around that face on the left-hand side. Um, the next piece of information that's stored in the half edge's state is a pointer to the vertex at the terminal end of, ha of the half edge. Be again, because it has orientation, we can talk about like the starting end point, the starting vertex for the edge and the ending vertex, because it, it starts somewhere and the arrow points to where it goes to. So there's a, a, an originating uh, vertex and a terminating vertex. So it is a pointer to the terminating vertex or terminal vertex. So the vertex, which is at the end of where this arrow is pointing would be this vertex, not this one over here, because this one's the originating vertex. Um, and the other thing it has, that the half edge has for part of its state is it has a pointer to the face on its left side. So basically it has this pointer. These, these arrows are basically denoting the pointers. So this half edge E0 is gonna have a pointer pointing to this face on its left. And then basically that's all the state that we have for a half edge. Um, and then essentially an edge is just an array of two half edges. So like basically this rectangle here, this corresponds to a data structure, which is just basically two half edges. And they're oriented in opposite directions. Any questions so far? Um, so you might say, well, what about, for example, if I want to find out the face on, you know, I have this half edge here, E0, and I want to find the face on its right side not the one on its left side. Well, I can't directly do this, right? Because there is no pointer here to the face on the, on the right side. But what I can do is I can, because E0 and E1 are in the same array, if I go down here, they're in the same array. So they're consecutive in memory, right? One comes right after the other. So if I'm at a particular half edge like E0, and part of the state that's stored in the half edge is what my index is. So this half edge E0 knows that it's zero. It's like the, in, the its index is zero. So what that means is I can get to the other half edge because it must immediately follow me in memory because its index is one. So it's in the same array, this array down here, and it, it, it has index one and I have index zero, so it must be right after me. So based on the information that's stored in this half edge, we can always find the other half edge. And if I, was look, if I had E1, if I was looking at E1 and I want to figure out what E0 is, I want to go the other way, it's a similar story. It's just that in this case, my index is one. So the value that would be stored in this, or in this data member here is one. And then that would tell me the, in, the guy that I'm looking for starts just before me. So I basically back up by one, one element in memory and that would give me E0. So I can move easily back and forth between these two half edges. Keeping that in mind, so if, if I have E0, that's what I'm looking at and I want to find the the face on its right side, what I do is first say, what's my, the opposite half edge, the one that points in the opposite direction, which I can get, get to by the process I was just describing. So I can easily get from E0 to E1. And then what I can say is, what's the face on the left side of E1? But the face on the left side of E1 is the same as the, the, uh, as the left, the, yeah, the face on the left side of E1 is the same as the face on the right side of E0. So you can find both the left and right. And a similar thing for, for vertices as well. Like if I suppose that I'm looking at E0 and I want to find the vertex which is, which is at the originating edge of this half edge. In other words, I don't want this one here, but I want this vertex over here. But there is no direct pointer from E0 to the originating vertex, but I can get to it because what I can do is I can go from this half edge E0 to the opposite half edge E1, and then I can say what's the terminating vertex for E1, which is this vertex here. So essentially, this is, 
this information, although maybe at first it might look like we don't have enough to do all the useful things we want to do, but actually this, this subset of information, this minimal subset is enough that we can basically answer any of the questions we want because we can kind of get around by, you know, doing various things like going to the opposite half edge and asking a slightly different question, answer pretty much anything that we'd want to know in terms of what things are adjacent to other things. Any questions about that? Okay. So these other slides, I'm just going to skip over. There's some, like a more complicated thing called quad edge data structure, but it's not needed for what we're doing in the course. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is just a practical thing that might help you with respect to testing. So the, the particular file format that's supported for like when you're, if you're reading, like, so you have basically a triangulation class that's provided to you. And the particular format that it, it reads and writes triangulations in is something called OFF format. It's a popular format for polygon meshes. So I just want to explain the, the format to you because it would be probably helpful to understand if you're trying to debug. You, you know, maybe you print out the, the triangulation that's produced and you want to look at it and see does it look right. You need to be able to interpret maybe what the, the file that's produced actually means. Um, so this is what I want to talk about here. So the format actually is very simple. I mean, it's a little bit more complicated if you talk about all the bells and whistles, but I'm just going to talk about the format sort of on the most basic level, which is good enough for this course and probably good enough for a lot of things that you might do. Again, this is presented a little bit more general than what we need here. Like it's presented more from the point of view of general polygon meshes rather than triangulations. But again, the only difference is that with a triangulation, first of all, like all the faces have to be triangles. And secondly, all the Z coordinates are effectively zero because like all of the triangles are lying in the plane. So this particular example here, because some of the Z values are not zero, essentially what we have is like a pyramid shape if you look at it more carefully. Um, but anyway, it, do, it doesn't really matter too much from the point of view of this uh, particular application. It's just that if you output a triangulation with this triangulation class, all the Z coordinates are going to be zero because basically all the triangles will end up in. Um, so what this format looks like, it starts out with a signature, which is OFF, which just says, hey, this is an OFF file. It's in this format. And then the next, next three values here, these are specifying the number of vertices in, in this particular mesh or triangulation, whatever the case may be. Uh, the next is the number of uh, faces, so the number of triangles in this case. And the next value here, which is allowed to be zero, meaning that I'm not telling you, is the number of edges. Um, it turns out that the number of edges, it, it can be determined based on information about the number of uh, vertices and faces, so it's kind of redundant. It doesn't need to be really given. Um, so, and mo most commonly it's just left out, but so you're allowed to say zero for this. It doesn't mean there are zero edges. It just means I'm not telling you, figure it out based on other information that I've given you. So that's kind of, this is kind of like a header here. And then this is followed by for each vertex. So we said there's five vertices. So for each vertex, there's an X, Y, Z coordinate. So the next five lines are X, Y, Z coordinates for the five vertices of this mesh. So like example, minus one, minus one, zero is the, the coordinates for V zero. The, the number from zero, by the way, the, the vertex indexes. And it doesn't say the particular indexes, they're ordered. This is zero, and then this is vertex one, vertex two, vertex three, vertex four. And then the remaining lines here, there's one line per face, like per triangle in the mesh. The first number here, which will always be three in our context, is because we're dealing with triangulations, it's the number of sides to a face. So because all of the mesh, the mesh has only triangles, these are always going to be three because it's a three-sided polygon. And then the remaining values are just the vertex indexes. So this means that it's the face that has three sides and its vert vertex indexes are 0, 1, 4. So V0, V1, V4 are, is a face. So if we look here, V0, V1, V4 is a face. So basically it's referring to this face here. So it's a, it's a relatively simple format, which is the reason why I chose to use this in the, the code that I provided to you, because it's, it's easy to kind of uh, parse with your eyes. And also there's some tools as well. Like there's a, I think in the, the lab, there's something called Mesh Lab, which is installed. Another tool possibly called GeomView that might be installed. And these can both display OFF files as well. Uh, I think Blender might, Blender might be able to do that as well. You, some of you might be familiar with Blender if you've done like animation courses. Anyway, there's a number of tools that you can use also to display these rather than just kind of trying to parse them with your eye and figure out what does it really mean. Any questions? So again, this is, this is really just to kind of help you with respect to the assignment by understanding a little bit better what the format is of the data that you're dealing with. So with that said, now we're like warping into another section of the lecture slides. The next unit that we're going to be talking about is memory management. And uh, yeah, so there's like a lot of... Uh, a lot of things in order to do them efficiently, you have to understand more about how memory is managed with C++ and things like operator, new operator, delete, and how to, to use these things and using new expressions and delete expressions and so on. Um, so 
Uh, when we're talking, with respect to this section, what I'm really talking about when we're talking about memory management is things that have what's called dynamic, uh, dynamic storage duration. These are objects that their lifetime starts where we explicitly start them by doing, using a new expression, for example, to create them. And they continue to live until we explicitly kill them by, by using a delete expression. So new and delete are basically the way that you do uh, you know, dynamic allocation in C++. And uh, what else do I want to say here? Depend, there's basically uh, four operators that are provided by the language for doing uh, memory allocation and memory deallocation, which are operator new. Well, there's two versions of operator new, one with square brackets and one without. Operator new without the square brackets, I just called it single object operator new. This is not really an official name, single object, but at least it conveys what it does. It's for allocating like single objects in memory, space for single objects. Whereas array operator new allocates arrays of like chunks of memory that's arrays. Then we have corresponding delete operations that go with them. Um, these things are different, however, from new expression and delete expression. So in your code, the way that most typically you, you uh, like create new objects that are, have like dynamic storage duration, things that they come into existence when you create them and they won't die until you explicitly kill them. Um, normally you do this, you create them with a new expression and then you eventually when you don't want that object anymore, you'll get rid of it with a delete expression. But operator new and delete are different things. Operator new is not the same as a new expression, as we'll see as we go through this. So I just want to kind of point this out initially. Um, it's a different thing and kind of keep that in mind as we go through, just because sometimes this is a point of confusion for people that you see operator new and you get confused and think this is the same thing as a new expression, but it's, it's not. So some of the potential problems that we can run into with memory management, um, I've just kind of listed some, some of the most common problems. Uh, the first problem that we can run into is we we forget to deallocate memory when we're done with it. So we create an object, and it, because it doesn't get destroyed until we explicitly get rid of it when we're doing uh, you know, dynamic storage allocation, um, and the common mistake is we, we create something, and then when we're done with it, we forget to get rid of it. So then we start to leak memory resources, basically have a memory leak, and eventually if the problem gets bad enough, we may exhaust all the memory on the system. Um, the other problem that we can run into is maybe like the, the opposite problem, which is we get so excited about not like wasting memory that we start deleting things before we're done with them. And this causes a different class of problems. Um, maybe in some ways it's a little bit more nefarious in terms of the problems that can be caused. Um, if we start deleting things before we're done with them, then what we create is like dangling pointers, pointers that point into deep space. Like they point somewhere, but the thing that we expect to be there isn't there, or we have references that are dangling. Um, and when we go to use those things, dereference them, bad things will happen because whatever we expect to be there isn't there. Another type of problem that we can have is we get so excited about making sure that we don't leak objects, we just start deleting them all over the place, like many times. So delete it once, delete it twice, it's, it's going to die. I'm going to keep killing it, you know, delete, 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 delete. Um, this is sometimes called the double deletion problem. Um, but it's, you, you can't delete an object more than once. And if you do this, often the consequence will be you'll corrupt the data structures that are used to track which memory is in use and which memory is not in use. Because if you stop and think about it, it's, it's the, the C++ runtime is not magical. It's not like when you ask it for memory, just memory somehow magically falls out of the sky. It, it knows, it has like a data structure which has sort of mapped out where is memory that's actually being used currently and where is memory not being used. And then when you ask for memory, it goes, well, there's a chunk here that's big enough for what you're asking that's free, I'll give it to you. Um, and the problem is, if you start doing like multiple deletions, what this can sometimes do is it can corrupt the data structures that are used to track what memory is in use. And you can imagine the consequences of that are pretty disastrous. If, if the, the runtime loses track of what memory is in use and what memory is not in use, really bad things are going to happen, right? Then if you ask for memory, it may give you memory that's already in use, and then you're overwriting other variables and so on. Um, so this is a so-called double deletion problem. So these are some of the problems that we can run into when we're, when we're doing uh, you know, dynamic allocation of objects. This next slide, I think there's not really anything on here that you need for the purposes of this course. The only thing I should maybe point out is that in this slide, sort of out of order, it should probably come after the next slide, but since it's in this order, I'll, I'll cover it this way. Um, I'm gonna be talking about the, an alignment uh, value for objects on the next slide, and it has to be a, a, a non-negative power of two. But other than this, everything else here is kind of more information than what's needed for the course. But that might not have meant anything to you because this slide really should have come first and I, I wanted to talk about what, what's meant by alignment. So the basic issue here, when we get into memory management and we start putting objects kind of where we want them in memory and so on, we have to be a little bit careful about where we place things because most uh, processor architectures place restrictions on where you can put things in memory. It's not uncommon to see, for example, that 
if you have some fundamental type like an int or some kind of pointer type or whatever, and it takes n bytes for the particular architecture that you have, it's not uncommon to see a restriction that that object must start on an address which is an integer multiple of n. It's not that it has to be this way, but it's, this is not an uncommon thing to see. And generally, it's not uncommon to have processors place restrictions about where things can be placed in memory. Like you can't just put things starting at any address you feel like. And part of the reason for this is it makes it easier, to, like more efficient to implement in hardware because you can basically ditch all the extra transistors and stuff that would be required to handle things that have kind of very arbitrary alignment. And the, the consequence, even if the processor were to support this, the performance would be very badly degraded when you start kind of accessing things in a, in a, that are not aligned in a, in a good way. So because of this, you don't really want to have misaligned data, even if the processor won't complain and, and kill your program, even if you tried to do it. So because of this, because there's this restriction on how data is aligned, we probably want to wait to query in the programming language uh, what the alignment is for a particular type. And this is what's done by this so-called align of operator. So align of, you can give it a type. You know, for example, T represents some type. It could be int, it could be a user-defined type. And basically what it, what it returns is a value, is a, it's basically an integral type saying this is the alignment that's required. So if it returns one, basically it's saying it can be on any address. If it returns two, it has to be on an even address. If it returns four, it has to be on a multiple of four. And, and the line alignment is re required, as was indicated on the previous slide, it's required to be a power of two. And this is basically because pretty much any built-in type on a processor is probably going to be a power of two in size, just because if it wasn't, it'd probably not be very efficient. The question? Is it the same as like the size of where it's computed at compile time? Yeah, this is a compile time thing, yeah. Because like, like it would have to, like it needs to know when it's when it's putting things in memory what their alignment is going to be. Yeah, so it's a compile time property of things. And I guess, uh, anything else I want to say here? I think that covers everything. So I'll stop here for today.